It's uh, really great to have a chat with you, Patrick. You've been responsible for onboarding so many devs and auditors into the space. And uh, it's going to be awesome to learn more about your background, uh, your thoughts around Web3 blockchain, and maybe give some more motivation uh, for devs to join this industry. So yeah, thanks for coming on, man. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having me, Andy. I've been watching a, a bunch of your videos. Uh, love the work that you're doing. Yeah, there's not a lot of auditors making the, the style of content that you're making. And I think it gives a lot of them a lot of confidence uh, for what to do, how to move forward. And uh, yeah, I've been in, really enjoying watching your journey as well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Really appreciate. Um, yeah, I saw you shared some of my recent videos as well. Yeah, so um, I think more people are slowly starting to discover my YouTube channel. Uh, because of my uh, Code Arena stuff that I posted last year and then recently getting a job at an auditing firm. Uh, so you actually mm. have a pretty diverse background yourself, um, including experience working at a hedge fund. Uh, so can you give us the story of how you actually got into the space? Yeah, so I was, yeah, I was working at a hedge fund or asset manager or, or whatever you want to call it. And that was when I was trying to figure out, okay, how does money even work? What What is this money thing? Because like you grow up and you, you buy stuff, but you don't, I, I feel like people don't really get like, okay, how, what, what even is money? Which sounds like this weird meta question, but I really wanted to figure it out. So I worked there for a few years and I got a really good understanding of kind of how big finance, big money really works. And I said, okay, this is really cool. Uh, I worked at a data provider for a little bit after that. And... I was always interested in, okay, how do we make big money more fair, more accountable, more transparent? Because kind of working in that industry, I was became disillusioned with the whole process. You know, like it's not that much, a big hedge fund isn't that much different than some random person sitting in their bedroom betting on number go up or number go down. And that was a little disappointing to see. Uh, but I wanted more products that helped normal people and helped just make the whole process better, have less information asymmetry. And I kind of randomly learned about smart contracts uh, when I was at this data provider company. Uh, Chainlink actually was looking for help scaling up, bringing on new uh, pieces of data into the blockchain world. And so they were like, hey, do you wanna put data on the blockchain? And I was like, that sounds really stupid. Because uh, at that point, I thought blockchain was kind of just this dumb asset that you buy and sell and trade and you do dumb shit with. And then I started learning about smart contracts and I was like, holy shit, this is the answer. This is this is the thing. And then I fell down the rabbit hole and I've just been absolutely, absolutely loving it ever since. And onboarding into the space for me was kind of challenging. And so I started just making a lot of content just to help people on board. Uh, and that became really, really fun for me. And as I got deeper and deeper into the space, the more I realized, yes, we need to help people on board because we are fighting this massively uphill battle. And the more people we can have helping us build, the better. Did that previous experience uh, sort of help you learn a lot of the financial concepts? Uh, because I've heard some devs, when they come into smart contracts, they sort of have trouble uh, learning the finance side of things. Um, so was your previous experience, first of all, uh, really helpful? And how would you recommend uh, people learn the finance side of things when they first jump into like DeFi and smart contracts? I would say absolutely. Uh, it, it's incredibly helpful. Most, the biggest use case of blockchain right now is money. In my mind, DeFi is like the number one most applicable, just best use case. And like the use case that solves a real world problem uh, the quickest. So yes, learning a lot of that financial stuff, I think is really important for getting into the space. Well, maybe not really important, but definitely really helpful. And the approach that I would say is don't overthink it. Uh, and don't get intimidated. Because a lot of the finance stuff, this is another thing that usually pisses me off about the finance industry. I feel like they use a lot of stupid, like elitist terminology, where like a lot of it's really simple. Like, oh, I'm going to short this asset. It's like, uh, I, I bet you a number go down. Like, that's what that means. I'm going to long this asset. I'm going to increase exposure in my portfolio to this um, to this category. It means I'm buying. Like, that's all that means. Like, so they have, there's all these kind of fancy terminologies 
where you can boil most of it down to buy and sell. Um, but yeah, getting a good idea of, of why some of these financial products are important and what impact they can have, I definitely think will give you a, a huge benefit, especially when DeFi is as prevalent as it is. Do you recommend um, any learning resources? You know, that's a good question. Um, that's something I don't know, actually. Uh, my journey was just kind of, I always wanted to learn, okay, how does personal finance work? Um, actually, no, that, that's a good question. If you don't understand personal finance first, I would say have that be your first step. Um, like if you're not familiar with index funds um, or getting out of debt, I would say take that as step one. There's a fantastic book called I Will Teach You To Be Rich. It's very entertaining. I, I forget who it's by, Samit maybe, but it's a fantastic book. It'll go over personal finance in like a really entertaining way. And then once you kind of have that base layer, then you can go, okay, let me get deeper into more sophisticated financial products and learning about, okay, um, collateral and, and all that stuff will just get you deeper and deeper. So I don't have a learning resource, but maybe I should, maybe uh, that, that's a good question. Maybe I should add DeFi to, uh, to my list of learning resources that I need to figure out how to uh, recommend for people. Good question. Yeah, uh, finance concepts, yeah, they're really important for learning DeFi and uh, because pretty much DeFi, we're trying to sort of replace the traditional financial system, right? Um, so yeah, definitely get that baseline. Knowledge is gonna be a great help uh, when jumping into smart contracts. You worked at Chainlink uh, after that for about two years, is that right? Yeah, a little more than two and a half years. Yeah, and I, I'd been working with them for around three years, but for Chainlink Labs, about two and a half years. Yeah, nice. Uh, so what did you do at Chainlink? So at, at Chainlink, I was a developer advocate, and my job was to uh, have engineers learn. Uh, or I usually divide developer advocacy into three pillars, which is use, know, and love. So uh, teach people about Chainlink, what Chainlink is, have an understand Chainlink, uh, and that was my my role. So in that role, uh, this is one of my favorite parts about being a developer advocate is you both get to and have to be an expert in your domain. So if I'm going out there and I'm going to be teaching about, you know, smart contracts, how to do stuff, like I need to know how to do it. So a lot of my time was like spent researching how to do X, Y, Z, uh, building demo projects, trying to integrate with different protocols. And... It was an absolute blast. And then I also got to make more. That also gave me the platform to also uh, make even more educational content. So educational was, content was always something that I, I liked doing. But I got to kind of use it as an excuse to go make more, um, which is really cool. A lot of people would ask me, hey, is like making YouTube videos part of your job? And to that, the answer is like, kind of? Like anything I put on my personal YouTube channel is mine. And it's not for the company, but it helps. So it's uh, it was an absolute blast. And uh, uh, yeah, doing that, I, I got to just get really, really deep into the EVM ecosystem. Nice. So yeah, you have a lot of educational content on YouTube, including uh, you've got a personal YouTube channel and you've also got um, some huge uh, tutorials on free code camp that's got over 4 million views combined. Um, those videos actually Correct. onboarded me to Solidity. I watched the Brownie one. That was the first one I watched. And yeah, because I watched it in January last year. Oh, and, nice. And yeah, your, your hard hat one wasn't um, even released yet. And yeah, yep, that one, yep. the Brownie one onboarded me. And then I watched the hard hat one later on. Yeah, the Brownie awesome. one is like 16 hours or something. And then yep. you yep. you upgraded to 32 hours. <laughs> The, the next one will not be the next one will not be another doubling. I will tell you that right now. I'm not uh, I'm not doing a 64 hour long video. There's no way. <laughs> but oh, that's that's fantastic to hear. I love hearing that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so valuable for onboarding so many people. Every time people ask me uh, where do I start, um, how to learn smart contract auditing, I'm always like, yeah, learn Solidity first. Jump on uh, Patrick's uh, Solidity tutorials on YouTube. Yeah, uh, super great. Yeah, how many devs do we have in the space? Do you know? So the number fluctuates pretty often, but there's kind of a consensus around approximately 50,000 active Solidity devs or, or smart contract devs, which is awesome. I mean, if you compare it to JavaScript devs, it's a drop in the bucket. 
But it's great that we've seen, even with 2022 kind of being this horrible market, we still saw developer activity rise, even when prices went down. Mm. And have you noticed that developers have um, gotten less because we're in the bear market or is it pretty stable? So, so even in the bear market, we saw a slight increase this past year, which is great to see. So it wasn't as big of a jump as the year prior, but it was still more devs which is awesome. Yeah, bear market. I, I think that's kind of the the bullish case for just developers in general. Builders going to build. Builders going to build. Yeah, that's interesting to hear. I'm um, saying with smart contract auditing, like we are in the, like the depth of the bear market at the moment and people are still uh, being, you know, I see people on Twitter just getting private audits and uh, finding these massive bug bounties. It's still going along, you know, very nicely even when we're seeing um, like massive tech layoffs and like bang companies, um, for example, recently. So it's kind of interesting um, to have that comparison. Definitely. And I, I think something particularly interesting is in the blockchain world, security is a lot different than the Web 2 world, because in the blockchain Web 3 world, once you deploy your code, if you screwed up, it's really difficult to roll back. It's really difficult to change. You know, I know we all use proxies and everything, but it's really difficult to change and the impact can be immediate. So the security really gets this extra lens, which I love to see. Um, and I think more and more people are going, are taking it a lot more seriously, which is fantastic because I think one of the things keeping retail at bay is the fact that every month it's like, oh, they lost another hundred million. Hmm, not going to go near there. So I, I, I love seeing more and more people get into the security space, wanting to take this, this more seriously. And yeah, definitely different from the Web2 world. And great to see an uptick in activity, even with, yeah, like you just said, Google laying off, what, 12,000 12, people, Facebook laying off a bunch of people. Um, absolutely agree. Mm. Yeah, and the impact of just Web3 hacks, you're pretty much like stealing people's money right out of their bank accounts. It's, mm -hmm. The impact is so different from traditional cybersecurity where you're just stealing people's uh, personal information. Um, or something yep. along those lines, like hackers will need to take another step to actually gain those financial benefits. But here you just like rip their money right out of their accounts. Yeah. And yeah, it's pretty insane to see. So wait, so let me ask you something. And I, and I know you're, you're running the show here, but I, I'm curious what your thoughts on this are as well. Since we're devs, we know that software is hard. It's hard to write. It's hard to read. We're gonna fuck it up. That just happens. When you take, when you have that in the front of your mind and then you go, okay, we're creating immutable smart contracts. What do you think about kind of that almost contradiction? We're going to deploy something immutable. However, humans are known to F shit up. Do you think that we can ever reach a space where we go, this contract is perfect. It'll probably never be hacked. How do you kind of account for that? What are your thoughts on kind of this duality of immutability, but also humans make mistakes? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. When I first got into the space, um, the purest viewers have everything immutable, right? But after you learn more about um, the difficulty of writing uh, correct software that is bug free, then that becomes almost like a balancing act. Um, I think, and may maybe there is a way to sort of build things up, uh, with small building blocks, right? That you can audit very thoroughly, do formal verification on it. And with those small building blocks, make them immutable and sort of slowly build up functionality from there. Uh, because yes, it's really, it's a, it's a balancing act like projects, they build out pretty complicated functionality and there's always like an admin there uh, sort of upgrading and um, controlling the security and just the direction of how the project goes. So yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think it's a question that we are still trying to figure out um, as an industry moving forward because yeah, things are still um, sort of developing um, as we go. So. It, it does make things more exciting though, because uh, we are pretty much like at the cutting edge of what's developing. So it makes the security more interesting, um, I think. So 
yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens in the next few years around that. I 100% agree. Yeah, like how do you corroborate all these uh, contracts? We'll find out. So did you find anything particularly difficult when you transitioned from uh, a financial side of things into Web3, um, which is a lot of like uh, development work and technical work? Um, what was uh, the thing that you found most difficult and how did you sort of overcome those difficulties? <laughs> I'll give you I'll give you the crass answer first. Um, the thing that I found most frustrating was all the tooling was written in JavaScript and I hated JavaScript. I'm more okay with JavaScript today. Uh, I still don't love how that's just what everyone defaults to because they go JavaScript everywhere. <laughs> to me, that's like saying, okay, I have a garden hose. This is my tool. So now I'm going to use it for every, or a better example. I have a hammer. Great. This is going to be my tool for everything. I'm going to lay the pavement with a hammer because that's what I have. Um, like what, there are different tools to do different things. And so coming into the space and having to learn JavaScript, I absolutely hated. Also, one of the big reasons why I started making tutorials is a lot of the tutorials, even the expensive ones, you know, version eight of Solidity was like right around the corner. And most tutorials were like 4.12 or something when I was coming to the space. And I was like, how am I supposed to learn when I'm like, when I'm like a two years behind all this stuff, um, which was really frustrating. So yeah, there, it wasn't super easy for me to get into the space. Um, but it's been fantastic to kind of, this is going to sound weird, dial in my learning process and learn how to learn much better. Now that I've done that. And now that, you know, like every week I'm trying to learn something new about the space and kind of advice that I, I'm starting to give people uh, more and more is just get really comfortable with being uncomfortable, get comfortable with knowing you're not going to know stuff and that's fine and it'll take time for you to learn and that's okay. So yeah, it, it wasn't just like, ah, oh, cool. I'm in this space. I get everything. I remember addresses were super confusing for me. I remember remix being confusing for me. Yeah. Like every, everything was, everything was brand new. I, I didn't understand like, wait, so this is immutable? Like, really? So some this this code is running on some dude's computer in his basement, and that's like, cool? I, I didn't understand any of it. But yeah, it, some big ways that I got over it was, you know, taking a deep breath, spending a little time on it every day, just getting, you know, it, it helped that I was like so infatuated with what was going on, just poured all over it. Uh, and I would say a, a big helping hand was the fact that Brownie existed which was why I've been that video because it was Pythonic. And I was like, cool, something I understand really well. The hedge fund that I worked at was Pythonic. So Python was like all I had been doing for a few years. I was like, okay, perfect. This is my transition point. Uh, and as I, I'm definitely biased, but I feel like the, the simplicity of the Python syntax does make it easy to kind of build deployment frameworks for your smart contracts because it's just like, okay, you know, um, contract.deploy boom, you're done in like two, three lines of code, you can do kind of everything that you want. And uh, that was definitely very helpful too. So yeah, take your time, use tooling that's familiar if it exists. And don't be discouraged when stuff doesn't make sense, because it won't make sense the first time, maybe not even the second time. But by the third or fourth time, that's when you start to figure it out. Yeah, definitely a learning how to learn and being more independent in that learning process um, is definitely going to be a massive help um, when we're in an industry that is sort of changing so much. I was just to say, uh, Foundry is a perfect example, right? Prior to Foundry, it was hard hat was is the well, even to today, it's the de facto framework. I, I did a, a little dive on kind of the top 10 DeFi protocols across different chains. I think hard hats like between 50 to 80%, like the dominant, the number one framework. However, you talk to all those same protocols today and they're going, yeah, like our next project is Foundry, right? And so like the tutorials, like the one that I just made in Hardhat, so Foundry wasn't even released when I made that Hardhat tutorial and that was like eight months ago, right? So it's, it's just so crazy how quickly this space moves, how new stuff comes up. I mean, we're talking about account abstraction recently. Uh, we did the merge recently, excuse me, to proof of stake. Yeah, agreed. Just stuff moves so quickly. So being comfortable knowing how to learn is super important because every few months you got to learn something new. 
Yeah. Um, I love Foundry. I've been using it um, quite a lot. I think a lot of the security researchers, they've um, started yep. to push for Foundry because it's just so easy yep. writing tests in Foundry and they run faster and you don't have to context switch like going from Solidity to like JavaScript, which, yeah, devs always shit on JavaScript and it's, <laughs> it's funny. I, I don't like yep. JavaScript either myself. Hey, woo! I mean, all right, so like I'm trying to be reformed. I'm trying to shit on JavaScript a lot less. I just can't help myself. Sometimes I'm like, ah, but disclaimer, you know, JavaScript has its place. The front end is for JavaScript. So that's my disclaimer, but I shit on it. I'm shitting on it jokingly for those of you listening and watching. If, if JavaScript is the tool that you like, if I'm being serious for a second, uh, that's the tool that you should use. If you like JavaScript, great, use it. But yeah, Andy and I, same page, dude. <laughs> but yeah, I, I agree. Like Foundry, if you're, especially when you're running like a test suite that has, you know, thousands of tests. Oh my God, the speed difference is insane. Have you worked with, um, one of my favorite features, if we're going to gush over Foundry real quick, is Foundry's debug, the step through debugger, where you can go like EVM code by EVM code. Oh my God. I've used that a ton, um, which is awesome to like learn a about the like low level EVM. And then you can also see exactly like what's on the stack, what's in memory. Um, if something's not working as expected. So I, I've actually been loving working with that. Yeah, same, same. Uh, have you thought about making a Foundry tutorial, maybe like 32 hour Foundry tutorial in 2023? Uh, I, I've, I've thought about it. I, um, yeah. So uh, f a big reason why I made the switch to start going into auditing and security full time was well two things number one we need more security in this space we're losing way too much money way too quickly i've said it a hundred times if this was web 2 and a protocol or a company just goes ah shit we lost 100 million in client funds you know they're getting sued people are losing i mean people lose their minds in defi but right now because it's like defi and it's super risky people you know people are just like oh well you know, that's expected in DeFi, but we need to up our standards to a place where normies can feel confident to come in and interact with our protocols and losing a hundred million dollars. It's just, it's just not acceptable. Right? So number one, we need to raise our standards. And then number two is that if I learn how to be a security pro an auditing pro, then I can go back, create content to give back to people so that we as a space can get elevated. So if I think of, if my mission in Web3, and, and I think this is, is to scale Web3, is to enable developers to do more, is to enable blockchain devs to become the super powered, you know, gods of coding that they should be. I need to think scale. How can I onboard? How can I enable as many as possible? And to me, uh, creating content and doing all, um, and creating education is, is how we're gonna achieve that scale. However, I think realistically, the only way to have any kind of authority or any type of, yeah, in order to have any type of authority, you need to have walked the walk, right? Um, it's very frustrating when I see a lot of people talking the talk without having walked the walk. So I said, okay, I need to throw myself in there, get beat up a little bit, get the scars from, you know, making mistakes, hopefully not, hopefully not very many mistakes, but I need to get those scars so that when I turn around and I give people advice on, on how to scale themselves up, how to make them better, I actually know what I'm talking about and I'm not pretending that I know what I'm talking about. So those are the two main reasons because I want to help scale the space. And I think if I learn, I will be able to help scale and then I'll be able to help some protocols be more secure as well. Nice. That's so exciting to see you join auditing and security. Uh, I saw you were thinking of uh, making some tutorials around auditing as well. Uh, is that going to happen in 2023? I don't want to put any timelines. I don't want to make any promises. Um, I mean that and the foundry, you know, in the foundry course, uh, let's just say it's something, both of those are things that are definitely things I think would be very good and important. I have, I give no promises. I make no timelines. Um, there's a good chance I will never do it. So don't expect anything and yeah, don't expect anything, but, but, yeah, I'm going to set the expectations low. Don't expect anything. 
Yeah, well, I've been seeing a lot more people on Twitter just posting more security stuff or wanting to jump into auditing. Uh, yeah, that's really um, good to see. Uh, I, I'd never seen so many act, uh, it's like activity of yeah people posting security stuff on Twitter. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess that's really encouraging. I I I hundred percent agree. Like every time I'm like, oh, is there this many people? I think a big part of it though is like a lot of these competitive auto platforms have really made it an approachable subject, right? Because now you can do you know audits are these time intensive things, right? It's really hard to get excited about security unless there's some goal. And I think a lot of these competitive audits have provided um, that platform to do that, right? Because you can just jump into an audit and you could win an audit. You could win some money, right? It's if you're, you know, if you're the top 0.01%, like you can make a living off of it. But yeah, I think, I, I think that those have been incredibly helpful in getting more people talking about security, or, or at least that's my thesis. My other thesis is that now that I'm doing it more, I'm seeing it more. And so I'm just kind of like looking for it more now, but uh, I 100% agree with you. I've been seeing it a lot more and I think it's fantastic to see. Uh, so I guess you have already answered this question by your actions. I was going to ask you, what is a good area to niche down in, in, in Web3, whether that's a developer <laughs> or auditing or maybe ZK. Uh, what are your thoughts around um, that? I think... I mean, I think it's there's more than just auditing, right? Because auditing only exists if there are devs building. So if building is something you want to settle down into, yes, absolutely. And that is a place you should settle down into. I think there's a lot of stuff Web3 can do and Web3 will do in the coming years. There's a lot of experimental stuff. I think so DeFi is one. We're always going to need more sophisticated DeFi products. I mean, Money is the most, in my mind, it's the most information, excuse me, the most important, most impactful use case for blockchain as of right now. However, governance is something that I've seen us as an industry kind of drop the ball on. Uh, right now, the model, if I can be crass again, which I will because that's just what I'm doing. The model is, okay, we launched a protocol. We need to monetize. Let's launch a token. Ah, shit, the SEC is looking. Aha, it's a governance token. Aha. And that's kind of like the veil of governance is kind of trying to hide behind or excuse me, to, to mask them for being a security, which I don't love to see because oftentimes they'll just dump on whoever buys and that feels really bad. And governance by plutocracy, I mean, Vitalik's written about this many, many times. I 100% agree with him. Governance by plutocracy isn't great. If it's just, hey, whoever has the biggest bag gets to make the rules, that kind of sucks. So I'm really looking forward to more people experimenting with that in particular. How do we make governance? I mean, because we have the ability to make like a brand new, like much, much better, more accountable, more transparent governance system. So I'm really excited to, to see people experiment with that. Um, a lot of people have been talking about GameFi. I mean, obviously NFTs and different arts. If that's what you're interested in, fantastic. I think there's a ton of experimentation to be done there. Um, but yeah, really the sky's the limit. I mean, now that AI is kind of just popping off, um, the, the integrations you can do with blockchain there as well. Insane. I mean, um, doing something where you have some financial application that's connected, you know, through maybe like a chain link Oracle to some AI algorithm that's running off chain. Um, and you can, it can, you can offload all that external computation off chain and then just get the results back on chain. Psh, the sky's the limit. I, Andy, I, I, uh, I could keep going. I'm going to stop. Uh, but yeah, I, I, if they, if you're looking to settle down someplace, come to web three, learn solidity and or Viper, and then just find something that excites you because that's going to help you go further faster. Yeah, I mean, AI plus blockchain, it's sort of like the mashup of buzzwords. And <laughs> it was like, yeah, and it's actually sort of happening now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, you know, the quickest way to get a VC to dump, you know, a ton of money into your project. Oh, yeah, blockchain, AI, uh, big data, you know, SEO, scalability, boom, you know, good, you're good. $100 million in funding just like that. So would you 
recommend um, any sort of uh, learning resources for people trying to come into the space, um, either on the dev side or the auditing side? Yeah, so on the dev side, I have I keep a running list called top 10. It's on my uh, dev.2, although I should put it on, um, I should put it in Lens Protocol, top 10 developer education resources or something like that. Uh, definitely right now that hardhead video is still fantastic. Uh, and it, I go a lot more in depth, especially in the beginning. Uh, I got a lot of feedback from the Python, from the Brownie one about, oh, you know, this part was still a little confusing. And so I was able to tweak those, which is, you know, why it's a lot longer because I went into more depth to, to make everything a lot clearer in the JavaScript 32 hour one. There's one lesson, uh, lesson 15, it's like hour 27 or something. So it's really, really late in the course. Um, that's a little outdated now, but the rest of it, it's good to go. So that would be my number one spot. It's free. Uh, I can't, countless developers we've onboarded. I just put out a tweet because I'm looking for some testimonials for, um, if, if I make a, another one. Um, so I was looking for some testimonials and I got a ton of people who hit me up saying, Hey, I work at, I work at open Zeppelin. Now I work at quick node. Now uh, I work at Chainlink Now I work at, you know, trail of bits now and they onboarded with uh, our tutorials so that one i would say is is uh was is my pick i'm obviously biased but there's a ton a ton of new free resources that come out uh alchemy university is really good crypto zombies is a classic and is still really solid um you know a lot of the uh the education sites that have been around for a while like dap university eat the blocks uh there's just so many free resources for you to go for you to learn, for you to grow. Um, I would say pick one, do it end to end. And this is my absolute favorite advice that I give anybody. Pick one, just pick one tutorial, pick one. And then stop, no more tutorials, and then do something with it, apply it. So either go to a hackathon, go to a, you know, Code Farina, Sherlock DeFi auditor competition, apply it somewhere because you spending time overcoming those obstacles is gonna be, leaps and bounds more of a learning process than doing another tutorial because you're going to you're going to be like okay i want to do x and now you have to not be handheld figure out how to do x and you're just going to learn how to learn you're going to learn the community learn where resources are a lot better so do a tutorial then apply it in some fashion hackathon auto competition or your own project so that's for the developer side for the auditor side it's kind of the same thing, uh, obviously maybe less hackathon and more auditor competition, but the auditor side, I would say is oh, there, there's a lot more to learn. So you would definitely want to look at something like, uh, Ethernaut, um, damn vulnerable DeFi. A lot of these kind of capture the flag like games that are a lot more lower level. One of my favorite resources, uh, is actually just learning how to code in Huff. I think Huff is this, it's this very, very low level assembly like language. And you learning how to do Huff will basically teach you the EVM. Uh, and just try to build some really simple smart contracts and building like even like a simple, you know, store of value in a single variable. Write that in opcodes, and you will learn a ton, like just from that one project. So uh, and then yeah, and keep, keep, uh, keep up to date with kind of the latest audits, you know, from popular protocols, uh, definitely check out like what's going on in, in Uniswap and in Aave. Um, uh, and the learning journey kind of will just never end uh, if you want to get into that. But so keep applying yourself. You know, this is where you go to audit competitions, uh, you try auditing things yourself. So it's the same same thing, take a tutorial, learn, and then go apply. And then while you're applying that knowledge, keep learning. That's my long-winded explanation to your question nice yeah really good tips i really like your um, point about applying the knowledge and not getting stuck in tutorial hell when yes. i was looking at your tutorials i was watching like a couple of hours and then i would do like a damn vulnerable DeFi challenge um, or an nice. ethernaut challenge or something like that i was like switching between the two so i can awesome. just like learn the syntax of what i need or whatever and then just go and apply it right away and yeah, it really helps to have an end goal in mind. I think either when like you want to build something, you go to a tutorial to find out how you do that. And then you just 
you just build the thing or you like um, solve a challenge um, or whatever. Uh, that's super important, um, I think, uh, when you go through tutorials. Do you think uh, people need to become a dev first before they become an auditor? Um, or do you think that they can sort of pick either one? You know what? I, I have my thoughts on this. I'm actually, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. I don't know if you've, you've mentioned this in another video. Uh, yeah, I'm curious on your thoughts first. Um, I think people can jump in to become an auditor right away. Um, because I've seen people do it before, just in 2022. I've interviewed some people and uh, they were just uh, sort of telling me their background. And then people in the comments on my videos, they're like, how the hell do you be an auditor without knowing Solidity? But <laughs> that's what people have been doing. Um, I think because Solidity is a relatively simple language to learn, there's not that much to it. And it's more uh, like auditing is more on the business logic side of things. So if you have like a technical background, you've like either done code reviews for other languages or worked as a dev in the past or a QA engineer or anything like that. And I transitioned from cybersecurity. So I wasn't even doing code reviews before um, jumping into auditing. Um, so I think people can do it, uh, but that dev experience will definitely make things like easier, uh, I guess, if you learn Solidity first. Yeah, that's actually why I asked you because I, I knew you had um, cybersecurity background before this. So I was I was willing to bet that that was going to be your answer. I actually so my background is the opposite. So I think that's why my initial thought is the opposite. It's like, oh, no, like you got to be a dev first. But I think I 100% agree with you. You know, a lot of the when I first started auditing, and I actually first started auditing, you know, way before Cypheron, but when I first started auditing, I thought it was just gonna be all right, like I'm looking for mistakes they made in the code. But no, like most of the time, the, the bugs are like, all right, like, here's how you withdraw. And you know, the code looks fine. But it's like, oh, you forgot to, you know, change the balance um, at the end. Uh, or you, uh, you have like a modifier that allows the admin to steal all the money, like that's an issue. Um, and yeah, I 100% agree, like the the last two audits that I did, all of the findings that we found were like nothing to do with the code. Code was fine. There was just some business logic that was off. Some way to, hey, you can withdraw more money than you thought uh, because of this weird edge case. So yeah, I 100% I agree. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. I, th I think, um, so I, I definitely think you can without learning the dev stuff first. I definitely think it's still helpful to have the dev stuff um but yeah i think i agree with you i think you can come in do a lot of the auditing without actually being like a phenomenal uh solidity dev first yeah um but i would say one aspect is sort of mandatory is learning DeFi and finance well um for auditing yes uh, on the auditing side because i remember when i first jumped onto code arena and started looking at the code um, even though I knew Solidity and knew like what was happening on the code level, I didn't know what the goal was. Uh, on the code. <laughs> yep. So uh, I, I was sort of like, I didn't even know what the hell I was looking at. So uh, definitely learning um, DeFi and finance is mandatory. Uh, but Solidity, you can almost get away with watching uh, your tutorial and then just a couple of, uh, couple of challenges like CTF challenges and if you're strong on the business logic um, side of things, like picking out those type of bugs, which I think most bugs are those type of bugs anyway, um, it's yeah. not going to be too hard for you to jump into auditing, uh, which is, uh, yeah, really, it's pretty interesting, I guess. Yeah, I would agree. I, I So I, I had to talk with Trust recently too. Yeah, he said the same thing. He's like, you know, learn how to, you know, learn how pools work, collateralization, if you're doing a stablecoin audit, okay, well, you better be real familiar with stablecoins. If you're doing a borrowing lending protocol like Aave, you better understand how over collateralization works. And yeah, all these finance terms. And for those of you who might be intimidated by that, once again, I promise, a lot of the terminology in finance is a lot easier than it 
sounds. So don't get intimidated. Keep having fun. Ask really good questions like why is why is this worth any money? Why does this have value? And if you kind of ask those almost almost childish questions, you will do better. You will learn more. Like why is this a product? Like who who would use this? Like who who cares? And if you find yourself asking that, that's good. Yeah, that's interesting because I also was sort of thinking like, why would anyone use this? Because I, I came from a pretty skeptical background when I first <laughs> came into this space. Uh, because <laughs> yeah, like previously, I think it's the it's true for a lot of tech people or cybersecurity people. They they think Web3 and blockchain and that's all like buzzwords and scam. And I was uh, sort yep. of from the same perspective when first coming in. And yeah, just leaving that aside and sort of asking questions um not around like why would anyone use this or what's the use case like just asking technical questions like how how does this work and um coming from from the security perspective uh that was when things got really interesting uh to me so you're yeah, asking a lot of questions when you're auditing um, it definitely like opens up a lot more like avenues of um attack um, i guess uh, sort of opens up your um creativity a bit uh, when you ask a lot of questions during an audit yeah my uh whenever i open up like the code base there's just like every other line is a comment from me like a little like cue so i know that it's a it's a comment or an explanation and then it's just <laughs> just like if, if you read any of the code it's just me going what the what the hell why is this a thing um, and then like maybe five minutes later, you know, I'll, I'll answer myself and be like, oh, okay, it's, it's for this. Um, or maybe I don't answer that. And then at the end, after I've looked through all the code, I go, oh, well, this, this shouldn't be a thing, um, uh, which is good. So if you find yourself being like, why the hell are they doing this? That's good. Keep asking those questions. Yeah. And from my interview with trust, he really inspired me to just dig deep into the code and try to understand everything. So what's your auditing process like? Um, do you read the documentation first, look at the code first, or like what sort of tools um, do you use? I'm, I actually, I keep refining it. I keep changing it. I'm curious on yours too, um, after, after I get mine. Um, but right now, like the, the way that I've found that I'm most successful is like understanding first from a high level what the protocol is supposed to do. Um, so like uh, a Code for Arena uh, competition that I did recently uh, was reserve a uh, reserve protocol, which is aimed at being uh, this basket of assets, stablecoin uh, product. And so uh, obviously having like a finance background, like I'm like, all right, cool. Like I understand a basket of assets. I understand what, it, you know, this tokenized collection is supposed to do. I, I, I like almost immediately, okay, I know from a high level what this is supposed to do. And then after uh, getting in now, you know, now I'm hoping I don't embarrass myself when the results come out and I did terribly, uh, but we'll find out. Uh, I'm not afraid. Um, but after understanding it from a high, the, the high level, then I'll go um, through, the, through the, the code and I'll look for kind of the external, the public functions that are supposed to do that thing. So reserve is this protocol where you could create um, your own stable coins. Like you create your own stable coins through the reserve protocol, which I thought was, wow, this is really cool. So I said, okay, well, what is the function that somebody presses to create a, uh, the stablecoin? So I look for that function. I go, okay, it's this function. And obviously it has all this stuff attached to it. So I start reading through the function and I start trying to understand how it's actually letting you uh, create this stablecoin. And then just going through that, you know, uh, I'll get introduced to everything in storage, all these helper functions to kind of all this stuff. And then just kind of keep doing that try to understand how these, the things that I think the protocol, the, the functions that I think the protocol should be doing work. Um, and that way I'll have a much deeper understanding of these kind of fundamental, um, important functions. Um, and then kind of after I have that deeper standing, um, then I'll go back and I'll go through all the contracts again, um, but more kind of like, excuse me, line by line. Um, contract by contract and I go okay I know what this file is for I know what this file is for and then I just go line by line and I say okay is this doing what I think it's uh, should do and then depending on how confident I feel maybe I'll go back again um, and one thing that I kind of glossed over that I think is really important too is having a teammate so if you have a teammate to you can get on a call all you're doing for the duration of the audit is just 
staring at your freaking screen, um, like ingesting everything about this protocol. So you and a friend or maybe a group of friends, if that's all all of you are doing, you can come to understandings much quicker. And if you have questions, you bounce them off each other. Um, that was actually one of the ways that uh, we found um, some really interesting bugs was we like mashed our understandings. There's a there's a saying, you know, two heads is better than one. It really is. Um, and so getting a teammate, getting a buddy is really, really helpful. But if you're doing a solo audit, you know, that's kind of my process. And then I have comments everywhere throughout the code. Whenever I have a question, I have a notes doc as well where I leave notes. Um, and then oftentimes I'll write my own like little POCs, like proof of codes. If they have a test suite already, I'll just use that. Like if they have hard hat, I'll write some tests in hard hat. Uh, this is one of the advantages of being a dev. Uh, I can just kind of write my own tests. If they're in Foundry, I can write them in Foundry. Um, but that's kind of the process now. Um, and I'm and I'm right now I'm this is one of the things I'm trying to figure out so I can give back to everybody else. Like what is, is there a silver bullet? Is there a silver bullet? Is there like this is what you need to do? I don't know if there is. I feel like what we're talking about is like the closest thing. It's like understand it and then go through it. But I'm looking for a silver bullet so I can kind of teach that uh, back to everybody else. So that's my process right now. So two questions to you then. Number one, what are your thoughts on that? And number two, what's your process? Yeah, so auditing as a team, that's a really good point. Um, I found, I did a couple of audits last year on uh, Code Arena and uh, Securium and then a spare bit as well. Every time of, I did an audit as a team, I felt uh, my level increased as I learned from uh, other people that I was uh, working with. So definitely highly recommended um, find a couple of people to uh, work with and audit as a team. Uh, so for me, my audit process has kind of changed a lot um, just during this time uh, because last year when I was doing Coderina a lot, I was working a full-time job in cybersecurity at the same time. So I was pretty limited to the amount of hours um, I had on each code base. So I didn't have the luxury of like reading all the documentation and understanding at a deep level and that kind of stuff. I was almost sort of speed running the audit. Like I would just go to the external calls, the fund transfers, look at the sensitive parameters and just look at those and try to like find some something that is the most, uh, that's got like a high probability of something going wrong and only looking at those areas uh, but now uh, recently when i joined an auditing firm uh, yeah i feel the luxury of just spending time and digging into the code and i'm um, just reading documentation uh, all of that is a such a luxury to have and you know obviously doing this full time now is it's great um, so yeah now just for like the past month or so i guess my process is pretty similar to most auditors and what you described as well just first step is understanding the code um, however way that helps um, right just uh, look at blog posts from the protocol uh, the documentation um, just try to absorb any sort of um, content around how this protocol works at a high level and then uh, when you jump into the code you actually know what the protocol is trying to do um, so you can sort of start to brainstorm ideas as you uh, look through the code. And yeah, definitely a lot of uh, comments and going back and answering those comments yourself. Um, a lot of questions and yeah, bounce ideas off your teammates. It's, uh, it's good to audit as a team uh, because you can help each other confirm findings and bounce ideas off each other. Yeah, all that. It's a really good uh, thing to have. And I feel... I am like going to progress my skills a lot um, now that I am working with people like all the time. Uh, so yeah, it's, I guess most people's process is sort of similar uh, along those lines as well. Uh, people will try to ask what is the silver bullet. Uh, I, I don't think there is any, I think just whatever works for you, how, like I've been speaking to a lot of people on this channel, right? And I've been asking them, what is their order process? And sort of just taking bits and pieces from other people that work for me. And uh, that's how I'm sort of um, 
refining my process and yeah i don't have it's not fixed i'm still like experimenting with uh various uh techniques as well so um yeah it's i guess that's that's the gist <laughs> of my process so so pretty similar it's like we're have an approximate idea of what we're going to do but at the end of the day we're just looking to to break your code somehow however we however possible however we're going to do that we're a little unsure but we're going to find out yeah exactly i guess the cyber security experience helps a little bit um just to have that sort yeah. of adversarial mindset um i was previously a penetration tester so just thinking about code yep. and adversarial um, perspective that that's sort of natural to me so um yeah that helps but obviously not mandatory um as we mentioned before you, you can jump in and sort of develop that adversarial mindset people have asked me whether they should learn traditional cyber security or like web 2 uh, bounty hunting or something like that before jumping into web 3 and yeah that's not necessary you can develop those mindset um a side of things uh, as you learn web 3 if that's what you're interested in yeah, that makes a lot of sense so I saw recently you posted on Twitter that you left Chainlink and you are doing some security initiatives this year. So yeah, what have you been up to these days? Yeah, so I, I kind of mentioned this a little earlier. So I left uh, Chainlink Labs about a month ago now, uh, which was a really tough decision for me because I still absolutely love the Chainlink project. I love what they're working on. Luckily, they wanted to keep me around, so I'm actually still working uh, as an advisor on the project. Obviously, a uh, much smaller time capacity, but uh, yeah, I I said, uh, you know, I looked at myself and I said, how can I continue to scale Web three? If that's my mission, which I think it is, how can I continue to scale more Web three developers, enable more Web three developers? And I think a big piece is security. And so, like I was saying, I need to get those scars myself. So. Uh, I've done a couple audits. Uh, well, I've done a few audits in the past, done some competitions in the past. Um, I work with some really, really brilliant people. And I said, okay, this is how we're going to do it. Uh, we're going to put our hand into the ring and try to help keep this space more secure. And we started up Cypher. And the plan is to, like I was saying, to take everything that we learn and then give it all back. Um, and teach the next generation of people to be even better than me, even better than where we are are now. Uh, and that's kind of always been the mission. And that was something that I feel like it wouldn't have been fair for me to stay at Chainlink Labs um, if I was just spending all my time auditing other people's code uh, instead of doing Chainlink stuff. So I felt like I needed to take a step back. Uh, but yeah, it, that's what we're doing now. Nice, nice. So I expect more content um, from you uh, moving forward, like around education, yes. uh, auditing yes. and all that. Everything. I mean, I still love making videos. I'm still going to make videos. I'm still going to write blogs. Um, so yeah, sure. A, a lot of them is probably going to be a little bit more security focused, but like the video that I'm working on right now, nothing to do with security. It's just, Hey, there's another really cool thing in this space that I want devs to know. Cause that's the other important thing, you know, uh, we need builders to keep building. And so I want to keep making content that helps them build, help them grow. So is Cypherin an educational company or auditing firm or combination of the above? So it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, it's an auditing firm. So speaking of which, if anybody's watching, uh, we are hiring security engineers. So hit me up. Uh, if you, especially if you've done like some code for arena or some Sherlock DeFi competitions, um, uh, yeah, so we're doing audits, which is very exciting. We're also doing code reviews, which is a really, really watered down audit, uh, much cheaper, a lot shorter time frame. The reason that we're offering that is we found a lot of projects will go to audit after they write their code, but they don't realize that they're not ready for an audit um, or they'll spend, you know, a ton of money to get an audit uh, where if they just spent like two grand to fix, you know, a couple of, of small mistakes that they would get much better results out of their audit. Um, so no, it's, it's a security company. We're doing audits. Um, but, uh, obviously, you know, I like just, I, I like to continue to make content. It's something that's fun for me. Um, and it's something that I think is really important. Um, and the, the other thing I, 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 I constantly think about is I don't love 
gated knowledge. Um, any content that I create, any any knowledge that I give back, I want to make free. And so I'm really just looking for excuses to make my content free. And if I'm doing audits, if I'm doing security, and then I make videos on that, on that, um, I feel like, okay, cool, I can make money um, doing security, and then continue to give the education for free. So I'm, I'm <laughs> Andy, at the end of the day, I'm just looking for excuses to make free content. So and, and making money doing audits sounds like a great way to do that. <laughs> nice, nice. So have you got any advice for people wanting to get a job um, at an auditing firm? You mentioned uh, Cypherin is hiring. Um, what does it take uh, to get a job in this industry or, or maybe advice for people um, who are applying? Prove that you know what you're doing. Prove that you know just somehow. Prove that you know how the code works, how the finance works. Prove that you know what you're doing. I think a real... I mean, one of the other advantages of these competitive audit platforms is that that's a real easy way to prove you know what you're doing. You know, even if you don't get the top placing, if you do mediocre, you know, that's proof that you have the capability to be a fantastic auditor, even if you don't do that well. Um, so just uh, do something that proves that you know what you're doing. You know, maybe it's just writing blogs. Excuse me. Maybe it's deploying code. Maybe it's you know, doing free audits for different protocols before they go to audit. Maybe it's just doing a, a code competition. Um, there's tons and tons of ways to, to get experience in Web3. There's just so, I mean, all the code is open source, right? Everything we do is open source. There's so many opportunities for you to just show, hey, I'm a badass. I know what I'm doing. So go out there, be incredibly resourceful, ask a ton of questions to, you know, ask yourself a ton of questions, ask the community a ton of questions. And um, and start applying. Yeah, nice. Uh, you mentioned Code Arena, like proving what you know. That is, I would say, the number one platform to sort of build up a little portfolio um, for yourself in auditing. I think it's pretty equivalent to if you're trying to get a job as a developer, you'll make a portfolio website showing off the projects that exactly. you built, right? Uh, so now. For auditing, you've got a little portfolio of the findings and your place on the leaderboard. And a lot of firms, they are starting to value that Code Arena experience. Like if they see on your CV, you're like rank whatever on the Code Arena leaderboard, they know that you can sort of jump in and uh, hit the ground running fairly quickly uh, because you will definitely have that base level knowledge um, if you are finding like uh, legit issues on Code Arena. So yeah, that's a, I would say that's a really good tip. We're, we're on the same page, Andy. We're on the same page with a lot of this. We're, we're, we're too agreeable this interview. This isn't a fun interview. We're just agreeing on everything. <laughs> Can I see this too? So what's, uh, what inspires you to make these videos? I, I th like I said, there's, there's so few people making, especially this style of content, especially video content because you know a lot of the times we're so busy like just staring at our screens uh what, what got you inspired to make videos and like i said been been, uh, been following you for some time love like watching your journey like your documented journey in this space it's been a blast to, to watch yeah I, I it's hard to say what made me want to start i guess um one motivation was to land a job in cybersecurity. so i started like posting cybersecurity content um in 2021, I guess. And that was mainly to just um, get my name out there. You know, like people post on Twitter, like learn in public, that kind of thing. So I just wanted to do something like that, uh, but on YouTube because less people are on YouTube. So it's easier to stand out, right? Um, so I think just career wise, it's definitely helped me like land jobs and that kind of stuff. So that was my initial motivation. And then uh, I essentially just like post whatever I'm learning and my journey, right? So I'm not at that expert level, but I can help people that are just one or two steps behind me. And my videos will help them because it'll one, motivate them and also uh, give them a bit of a roadmap to follow if they want to go in the same direction. Uh, and ever since I started posting uh, the Code Arena content last year, yeah, a lot, I've seen a lot of comments. People said they, they saw my videos, they went on Code Arena, and now they're doing very well, and they're like very thankful for, for my videos and that kind of thing. Uh, and that is always good to see, right? Um, I'm sure 
you get a big kick out of people on Twitter saying uh, they've, you know, made their first smart contract uh, project uh, based on your tutorials, uh, that type of stuff. Uh, so that is a big motivation uh, for me now, just to just to sort of lay down the uh, the breadcrumbs of uh, what I did, and if people want to go in the same direction as me, they can sort of follow that. And it's all nicely timestamped on my YouTube channel, like from a complete noob to <laughs> to where I am today, um, which is still not like super advanced, but you know I'm on the path. Um, yeah, like my first, my first video was just like me getting a stupid gas optimization thing on <laughs> on Code Arena, and uh, yeah, j just even that, uh, people were interested in watching because they can see the progress, and it's sort of like, yeah, uh, it's sort of like uh, almost like watching watching a, a journey or like a. There is some stakes to that as well, right? Because uh, previously I was like doing videos on cybersecurity certifications and that kind of thing and and uh yeah i was doing the oscp exam which was a pretty tough exam where a lot of people like take multiple attempts before passing and then yeah people were just like sort of watching it for the popcorn see if i pass or fail and uh, <laughs> sort of like a bit of an entertainment as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> the, the popcorn if you pass or fail oh that's <laughs> funny hopefully they were like oh, i hope this hope this idiot fails <laughs> um. <laughs> That's too funny though. That's great. I love that. Yeah. And what what's your motivation for your YouTube channel? I think you started when you uh, joined Chainlink. Is that when you started posting regular content? No, I see. I've I've always liked making videos. Um, I just feel like it's really easy to get context um, from learning. Um, and it was just it was just really frustrating for me to learn like a lot of stuff. Like learning code for me wasn't easy, um, but yeah, like, I just want to give back and like, uh, be able to say, all right, here, if I were to do this again, here's how I would have liked to learn it. And it's just a big part of it's just it's a ton of fun for me. And I think it's really important for us to scale. Uh, like, there's a lot of things in this space that are going to help us move much quicker, that is hard to monetize. And I think like free content is one of those things. Um, and so I think it's, it's just, it's fun. I know it's important. I know it's good. Um, and so I just, I, I like doing it. I've, I've, I've just always liked making videos. I feel like if I'm trying to understand like a thing very quickly, videos have always kind of been my go-to, like even in, uh, in code Farina, you know, a lot of them will do like a video code walkthrough. And sometimes I find those more helpful than the docs. Um, when I know kind of the meme is like, oh, did you read the docs? Eh. Uh, but sometimes the docs are terrible. Sometimes they're awful. So it's it's much better for someone to just like talk me through it um, because then they can give me the context of like, oh, here's what we were thinking with this function or here's what we were planning on doing. I, I don't, I've just always liked videos. I've always liked making videos. I've always liked watching videos. Um, and then the other big thing is um, if I have like literally written on my board, I have a saying, if I don't write it down, uh, I won't learn it. Just full stop. So for me, making a video forces me to learn something to the point where I can teach it back. And if I can learn something to the point where I can teach it back, that means I've got it really dialed in. And it forces me to write it down. And I can't tell you how many times I've written an article or made a video six months later, forgot everything about that concept, and then be like, shit, I, I done this before. And then just like watch my own video to like reteach myself the thing that I learned six months ago. So on any of my videos, if you see them have any views, it's really just me going back and rewatching to reteach myself some concept that I already learned. Uh, but it's all that combined. That's why I, I just love doing it. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Teaching is a great way to learn. Um, when I learn something new, I just make a little video about it, and that forces me to understand it at. A deeper level and perhaps there's some sort of concept that I was missing um, and then when I'm researching like what should I put in the video then it actually triggers me to say oh actually I don't understand this part very well um, I should understand it before I talk about it so I don't sound like a complete idiot so uh, definitely <laughs> teaching the... is yeah teaching is good <laughs>
the the fear of looking like an idiot is a is a great motivator for learning i agree mm. <laughs> yeah so have you got uh just any final advice um for people trying to get into the space uh, motivate people and uh yeah like uh, tips yeah i would say probably two biggest tips i give anybody listening right now number one Actually, three. I'm going to go with three here, Andy. Number one, you're welcome here, and we need you here. That's the first one. We need more devs. We need more t people building really cool stuff. We need more people learning this cool stuff. So please come. You're welcome here. We want you here. And if anybody tells you otherwise, ignore them. Ignore them. Push past the haters. You're absolutely welcome here. Number two. It's okay. You're gonna get frustrated with things. It's okay. You're not gonna understand a concept the first time. It's okay. Everyone learns at their own pace. Don't worry if you're taking too long. Go your own pace. You know, be aggressive with your time frames, but it's okay. It's okay if you don't understand things the first time. So that's advice number two. And advice number three, as you're learning all this, as you're growing, you're going to feel this clinging imposter syndrome like you don't belong. Do everything in your power to squash that, kick that out the door. If you go to Remix right now, actually, screw Remix. If you go to the Solidity Docs right now and you read any line from the Solidity Docs, welcome. You're a dev, you're an auditor, you're just at the beginning of your journey, you have just as much of a right to ask questions, be here, make mistakes as everybody else. So those are gonna be my three pieces of advice. Number one, you're welcome here. Number two, it's okay. It's okay if it takes you a long time to learn stuff. And number three, squash that imposter syndrome. You will get it, you will feel it. Do not let it stop you. Do not let imposter syndrome stop you. So those are my three pieces of advice here. Nice, nice. Yeah, love your tips. That's awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, loved your experience, uh, hearing about your experience and uh, the tips of people uh, trying to get into the space. Yeah, 100%. It's, I'm sure it's going to motivate a lot more people to come into the space. So yeah, thanks for joining me, uh, Patrick. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks for having me, Andy. And likewise, yeah, looking forward to more of these videos. Um, really enjoying the content that you've been making. Um, so yeah, looking forward to, to seeing more of you.